Hi, everyone. So welcome to the second event of um, Architecture and Politics. Um, so thank you all for coming. Uh, we're going to start off with a talk from the founder of Part W. Um, so I'm going to pass it on to Zoe Berman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, amazing. So uh, I am um, really pleased to that the curator, curatorial team have picked up architecture and politics as a theme that is so strong in the work at WSA. And it's really inspiring to know that you as students and the next generation of architects are consciously giving thought to socio-economic politics and design. And I'm first off going to talk for about eight minutes, just without any slides initially, um, to set a bit of a scene around architecture and its relationship to some political issues. Um, that, I hope, will root the next part of my talk where I will present more specifically my, my own activism work, the joint work of Part W, and I'll then be sharing some slides to illustrate examples of some of the issues Part W and co-campaigners are tackling around design and equity. I really value all the hard work of the student curators who have made this event happen and have suggested this topic to seek to talk about politics, architecture and equity in a direct way. It's valuable that the WSA is doing this and I myself advocate for practicing architects needing to reposition and change what our roles are within a context where Construction is one of the leading contributors to carbon emissions. Indeed, if the cement industry was imagined as it being a country, the cement industry is the third largest carbon dioxide emitter in the world with up to 2.8 billion tonnes coming third behind the US and China, if it were a country. So that the core component um, that is used ubiquitously in construction um, and creating the cement that we use in foundations and floor slabs and structures, um, if it's giving off more carbon a year than the whole of Europe, this is a climate catastrophe that is inherently political, is already impacting um, most, and, and that that the, the climate the climate disaster is already impacting the most on on the people who are poor, on women, um, and on and on children. And we need to reposition reposition our role in a time where buildings have been the structures that have enclosed us in an unprecedented global lockdown where governments have required citizens to use their homes as places of shelter to create a buffer between us and a zoonotic disease, a disease that has passed from animals to people as a direct result of human encroachment into wildlife habitats. A closing um, globally of all buildings has required people to lock down in their homes. And as you know, um, this has shone a, a stark light on the difference between those who have homes and those who don't. Those who are living in spatial comfort compared with those living in cramped, overcrowded, limited, limited dwellings that might have issues of noise, damp, lack of light, um, lack of access to green space and so on. The role of healthcare services, provision and physical infrastructure of healthcare has to be globally reassessed. And here in the UK, that is happening against the ironic backdrop of decades of government austerity that has led to the closure, the demolition and the sell-off of built space. The decisions that has led to this lot of loss of community spaces and local health centres is defined by political policy decisions. Europe is now on the cusp of what is going to be a humanitarian disaster as people flee the regions of Afghanistan and asylum seekers and political refugees will no doubt be held in woefully inadequate camps, adding pressure to what are often referred to as temporary shanty towns. These migrant villages aren't temporary. Let's remind ourselves that the, the Calais encampment first came into being when migrants appeared in northern France in the winter of 1998, then mostly people who were um, fleeing from the conflict in Kosovo. If my maths is correct, some of you weren't, maybe weren't born in 1998. The roots of these political and spatial problems have been decades in the making. These are issues of land, of territory, of the flow of people, of politics, and the provision of space for people. And politics is built into architecture. Indeed, through history, buildings have been used variously as political tools 
at one extreme as methods of propaganda with buildings used to communicate and exemplify power, or at the other end of the messaging spectrum as examples of a country or a culture promoting freedom, tolerance and acceptance, architecture and politics. We have, as a profession, ceded to others much of our power to make a positive change. The fact that approximately just 13% of buildings built each year in the UK today have an architect involved at all is testimony to our decreasing influence and reduced impact. The industry and its institutions have been supplicant to and operated at the mercy of economic markets. For too long we have, and I will with honesty include myself within this, many practitioners have too often been distracted by pretty images rather than really making meaningful change. A beacon of positivity is being shone by many of you who are seeing these wide ranging and complex challenges and it's energizing that many grassroots organizations and collectives are picking up from those who have gone before, undertaking activism within design and digging into the ethical and political issues, challenging the ways bu- way in which buildings are made, developing new frameworks for value. And it's commendable, commendable that you, many of you as students are thinking about political problems whilst experiencing so much upheaval that this past academic year has no doubt brought for you. In all of this turbulence, in a time of political, economic and technological upheaval, we know that the vicious fallout from neoliberalism that has dominated our immediate history has shaped our ways of living and our globalised aspirations. The fallout from that faulty global system has been and is right now negatively impacting the most on women, marginalised groups and people who are poor. Western government's proclivity for pillaging and extracting resources from the global south turns up right on the doorstep of design and construction in various ways. For example, much of the metal, timber, oil-based materials that we use to refurbish, rebuild and construct buildings, most of those materials are being shipped from overseas. Not only does our industry have a stonking carbon footprint, we are much of the time blindly using materials that come from sources where the human rights records may be questionable to downright dreadful. And the construction industry is one of a handful of industries that knowingly or unwittingly has the highest rates of modern day slavery. There is a lack of unionization, support and lack of steady pay for construction workers. And as architects, we have a real opportunity to do better, not only in terms of the designs that we create, but to advocate for better conditions for all the craftspeople and construction professionals who we work with to realise design proposals. On the face of it, none of this sounds especially cheering. However, there are aspiring actions and initiatives and groups out there who are countering many of these problems. Within all of this, my own growing area of specialism is gender equity within the built environment. And the rights of those who identify as female is important for all genders. We all deserve freedoms, recognition and value equally. Men are crucial in making this happen. A gender equal profession is important and beneficial for all. And the benefits of social justice not only make for happier ways of working and living, but all the data points towards gender equity making more economic sense. In 2018, I founded a group called Part W. So having set out this wider overarching context of architecture and politics, I will um, now talk about the work of Part W a little bit more. The curators of today um, have asked if I talk from a personal perspective about why I set it up, which is potentially relevant here in this, in, in, within this theme about architecture and politics because um, Part W was inherently born out of my own political misgivings. So I'll try to answer that question about the roots of setting up the group and present some of our actions to date. I've been asked to talk about my personal experience, but all of Part W that Part W has achieved and all the work we're doing right now is very much a result of collective work. So having given this wider introduction, um, let's have some slides. There's always the moment of pause. Um, Now... Alice Brownfield, actually, who presented on on Friday, um, she nicked a couple of my opening slides, but uh, the uh, the silver lining of that is that I can kind of jump jump straight in and um, 
maybe some of you uh, already were introduced to a little bit of this. So, um, okay, so just to go up, right. So um, I'm now going to look at my notes over here, turn. Um, so I'm a director of my own design collective and I lead design projects for clients alongside undertaking campaign work and activism and teaching. And I was asked to discuss in part my personal experience of the work that I do. Um, so just to know that in terms of professional balance, I run my design office much of the week and spend around a, a, a day a week um, and then extra overspill time um, that then goes to uh, committed to Part W work and, and to the, the, the um, campaign work of Part W. Um, so... Uh, just a little bit of context. Uh, Part W started in my mind in 2000, sort of around 2016, 2017, when I was becoming much more aware of the rights of women coming under threat. And we were societally really seeing a pull backwards and indeed a taking away of human rights and global civil rights coming, coming under threat. I went along to the first Women's March in 2017, which led to me joining um, the Women's Equality Party as an affiliate member and attending branch meetings that really opened my mind and my awareness to the statistics around women's um, equality. So many of the statistics that I was hearing about in those meetings was for me as an architect, heavily intertwined with issues of homes, infrastructure, provision of space and provision or lack of support within the built environment. So, for example, I learned that in the UK, rent takes up 43% of a woman's median earnings compared to 28% of men's. Women need over 12 times their annual salaries to be able to buy a home um, compared to eight times of men. And these issues are directly linked to affordability and the gender pay gap, which then affects women's access to housing. And whilst the vast majority of people who are recorded as sleeping rough on the streets in the UK are male, 67% of those recorded as statutorily homeless, i.e. those who have no fixed address, are women. When we take into account those fleeing domestic violence, those sofa surfing, or having to move around possibly with children. And that's just housing. So such issues and problems are then mirrored and carried on through in terms of infrastructure, provision of public space, play space, and so on. So women are affected by and experience the built environment in particular ways. And our cities so often are not made easy for women and girls and those who um, have physical disabilities and need additional support. So I was really keen to convene voices and points of view around the issues of gender equity in design and placemaking. And I run my own practice as a collective, a group um, of which I am the director where I bring together experts on a project by project basis. And so it was a natural step for me and the way in which I work in collaborative ways for me to seek the views and opinions of others on this issue. Um, and so in 2018, I invited a number of women who work across the industry to sit down to a series of informal discussions over crisps and wine so that together we might look closely at what the challenges around gender and design are to start identifying problems and then also to start de um, developing some possible solutions. And this image here shows some of the many architects, engineers, planners, educators, community engagement experts, sustainability and transport leaders who have been part of those discussions. Now, um, in our early discussions, when we were talking about the problems of gender and design and placemaking, a point that we found that we kept coming back to was representation and visibility and looking at the way in which those who work within architecture, design and placemaking are or are not seen and valued. And this image here is a frankly dreadful example of digital editing. Here on the bottom is the image that was used to promote the lineup of the Brits who built the Modern World BBC programme, showing Patty Hopkins digitally removed from that publicity image. So what is showed here is a panel of five male architects, when as you see the true image is above, and it's notable that the figures who at the BBC considered that those who shaped the modern world um, are all male and all white. 
So we started looking at examples of the way in which women have been forgotten and overlooked within our industry. And thinking about this issue of visibility, recognition and value, we looked at represent as an example. Uh, we look to representation in international design awards. And this is a statistic that appears in the study Going for Gold by Dr. Liz Walder, which reveals the imbalance in the major international architectural awards. And that includes the Pritzker Prize, the Japanese Imper um, Premium Imperiale, the Royal Gold Medal, and so on. So we decided to look more closely at one example of that. And Alice spoke a little bit about this on, on Friday when she presented. And what we started out doing was what we challenged that this wall that stands in the entrance on the left-hand side when you go into um, the RIBA HQ in London, um, this is on, on the left behind the reception desk and into this wall are carved the names of all the many men who have won the award. Um, uh, this award has been given since 1848. And we started our work in 2019 and we ran a social media campaign that led to the alternative list. Alice presented that on Friday. And our campaign invited others to look back through history to reassess who has been missed out and overlooked and to draw attention to the many forgotten women who um, have been overlooked in the way in which we reward and recognise people. And... This is um, an example of that social media campaign where we invited people to suggest women who, through history, have, have done fantastic work. So you see here, um, for example, um, uh, Sarah Castle making her suggested nomination, then a profile photograph of that in, um, brilliant woman and her fantastic work. So this was this, um, this series that we did on social media, inviting people to participate, to make suggestions, to get involved. And then, um, and I know that Alice on Friday showed the final list. This I quite like as um, an example of, uh, it, it's, it's the list as it was work in progress. Um, and what what we're, the kind of the game that we're playing that we're inviting people to to think about is if in 1978 um, the award was given to um, Jorn Utzon, um, how about it having been given to Jane Jacobs? Or if Mies van der Rohe was given this award in the 1950s, what about you know what about the recognition for for Jane Drew, for Norma Schlereth, for Men Net to Silver, and so on? Um, and this copy of the list, I, I, I like it in, in sort of this stage of when you can see the, um, the unfinished nature of, of that work, um, the, the work in progress, and also thinking about those gaps, those, because there will always be gaps, there will always be people who, um, you know, who, who we don't know and who history has forgotten. And so there's this idea of kind of the missing, um, missing, missing figures throughout, throughout history. And then another step that we, um, that we, we wanted to see happening was then we set about making nominations for brilliant living architectural practitioners so that there could be no excuse of from the judges well no women were put forward for the award so we we, we wanted to know that that, that they were that you know, women were being submitted for consideration so the collective um, nominated uh, housing architect Kate McIntosh the Czech architect and designer um, active in London and in Prague Eva Jerichner the American architectural academic Dr. Sharon Greta Sutton, the architect, planner, writer, Denise Scott Brown, the British collective Matrix. And we were very, very public about this on social media. So we were encouraging other people to sign their, um, to put forward their, nom um, put forward their nominations, to support our nominations, to be signatories to the submissions um, for, for, uh, for these people to be considered by the judges. And we learned that other people with, were getting involved in doing this too, which was fantastic. So other people um, uh, put forward, um, we heard of, and there, maybe there were others as well, but we heard of um, Amanda Livy, Yasmin Lari, Sarah Wigglesworth Grafton and um, being, being put forward. And so then it was absolutely fantastic that we learned that Shelley McNamara and Yvonne Farrell were to be given the award in 2020, that's now happened. Leslie Loco was given the Annie Spink Award in 2020, which is a nomination that was led by Matthew Barrick. And I contributed towards that in a small way. The Annie Spink is granted to someone who has made a substantial contribution to architectural education over a significant number of years in higher education. And um, though it is given in memory 
of the female architect, Annie Spink, it had previously only ever been given to one female um, educator. And we cheer on and we're thrilled to see that Sir David Adjo was um, nominated for and, and that he won the 2020 award, making him the youngest and first ever black architect to be granted that particular Royal Gold Medal. Now, um, on this thread of representation and visibility, this is a little study that I did as part of the prep work for an event that, that we did at the Design Museum. I wanted to see what the algorithms are bringing up day to day. Um, here is what this, uh, this kind of collation shows um, in the most used of search engines, Google, revealing the famous, in inverted commas, architects that we or other people with an interest in design or perhaps prospective students might look to for inspiration. And here, this lone lineup shows the way in which the that algorithm is skewed with just five female design um, designers and no black architect being featured here at all in that Google, um, that Google ask. So we know that there is a huge problem of bias and built-in bias in the tech and algorithmic information that is out there and this um, architecture is is included within that um, and and is susceptible to that problem we have um, run various talks and events that introduce people to the many forgotten women in architecture and these events are about dissemination of knowledge and relearning and we also Last year, during the running for a new RIBA president and RIBA council members, we worked with others to put out these ideas of what a revitalised and radically realigned RIBA might look like, with contributions made on these seven points by a number of individuals and collectives, including but not limited to ACAN, After Party, Harriet Harris, Jeremy Till, Yemi Aladron and Fiona MacDonald, Piers Taylor, Alice Brownfield um, and I put forward this section on political agency. And this is a, an alternative proposition, a series of ideas that we would love to um, see candidates and, and presidents and the institution aligning themselves with to, to build a new set of non-hierarchical principles, a chance of the architectural community um, doing things in new ways and a new set of principles to, to generate an alternative kind of discussion. And that was on, that was on social media um, and uh, positively generated you know, some sort of chatter and some discussion about new ideas and new ways of thinking within, within architecture. Um, and then um, lastly, I... I had the pleasure of speaking on Radio 4. Alice, Alice has recently been discussing des, um, design and gender equity in reference to the refurbishment works at the Houses of Parliament. Um, we've Our work has been noted variously um, in some newspapers and so on. Um, but really, I think to, to kind of to close on, um, and I'll just stop, uh, stop sharing. Um, I think to close on, it's this kind of question of why does any of this matter? Um, why um, is, is part W and myself advocating for equity within the profession? Why, um, what does, why do it and what does it have to do with politics? So um, put very simply, women make up half of the global population. So a profession and a built environment that does not serve well half of a population is wasting talent, is wasting knowledge. We're missing out on a rich and varied set of ideas and skills. And two, it makes good economic sense to ensure public money and private projects are being spent in a way that serves best 50% of a population. And architects can make a real positive contribution to making that happen. Um, so, I hope that um, I hope that that was useful and interesting, um, and and um, presented some of the things that that we have been up to, some of the ideas um, that that we've been talking about within Part W, um, maybe some some food for thought. And I hope also now, having said, um, we will have time for for Q and A. I hope that leaves. Um, enough space to before the presentation to the award winners this year um, I hope that it now leaves enough space to 
for me to take any questions, um, have any discussion um, or kind of answer anything that um, people are interested in maybe hearing hearing a bit more about, because um, I whistled through that um, at quite a rate to try and pack in quite a lot of things. Thank you for your talk. That was actually very clear, I thought. Um, and I did actually have some questions in regards to why does it all matter? In Because you are also a design tutor. Um, so how would this kind of, would you take that on forward into reflection, into architecture and urbanism, uh, into your design teaching? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, in terms of within teaching, I think, um, I think oh, there's lots to say, but I think one of the, I think a key issue. So first, if we talk about example projects, preferences, inspiration and references. So um, and Harriet Harris, I think, did a fantastic piece of work where she um, and it's it's available online. I can try and find the link. Um, women write architecture. So what she picked up on was the fact that the reading lists, which students are presented with, you know, the start of every academic year, or maybe from term to term, um, suggesting the work that students might read uh, was has been historically has been heavily heavily dominated by a writings by male architectural historians critics. Um, and also about work that is by male architects. Um, and so the problem there is that we are limiting our horizons on the work that we're looking at and the work that we're understanding and learning about. And not only is there a tendency towards there being in, in reading lists and precedents, is there a tendency towards um, a, a default to the male canon. The male canon also tends to be Western or Northern European um, American white men, which means that we are then missing out hugely on ideas, solutions, the thinking of a much, much broader set of people, which then limits, limits our view limits our understanding, limits our solutions to problems. So that's in references, inspiration, precedence. Um, and then also, I think it's also important in terms of who is teaching and who is, who is carrying out the teaching and what lived experiences do those people bring. So um, I remember a <clears throat> one of the people who, um, who you see on the images of, of people who've been part of Part W. It's a fantastic architect called Tahira Ruff, who works for RCKA Architects. And she was interviewed, and I'm, I assume that she doesn't mind me saying this um, because she was, uh, she was interviewed about this. Actually, I mentioned it in an article a couple of years ago. She talked about how, um, as someone from a working class background, that she, um, that she dropped her accent, her strong London accent, to, to fit in, to try and blend in, to match the accents that she was hearing around within the School of Architecture that she went to. And that is a loss because that is a loss of someone's um, cultural experience and knowledge, which if we then flatten and squash those ideas down or we don't give capacity for alternative points of view to be allowed space, then that will feed into the way in which we design because it limits the way in which we think, it limits the lived experiences that we're bringing to the table and it then limits the opportunities or the perception of um, the, the profession for a next generation coming through feeling this isn't the sort of place where I fit in. You know, I don't have, you know, I don't have the right accent, I don't speak in the right way, I don't have the right, you know, inverted commas, um, uh, sorts of cultural references. I think Sound Advice, um, run by Joseph Henry and Pooja Agrawal, is doing amazing work in this regard um, in terms of talking about those issues of, of race, of diversity, of um, lived experience, and that, that what that then brings to uh, an approach to design that is rich and varied, and then can then, for you as students, can then give way to 
richer projects rather than remaining in, you know, people kind of feeling that there's an expectation to stay in your lane. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, another question was in regards to um, the landscape. So you mentioned there was a picture earlier on that you showed um, where it isn't designed for uh, an area can't be designed, isn't designed for women. So there are stigmas such as like city, or some cities are designed for men and some cities aren't designed for a particular type of person. Would this be also kind of thought forward into uh, for students um, from a design choose perspective? Yeah, so I guess, um, and it's really, it's a, re it, it's a really, really interesting one because what we find I mean, Park W has only been around for we're not if we're we're ten days off our third birthday. Um, so um, as a group, we're as a um, we're we're very very um, we're multi generational in terms of the people who are in the group. But as a group, we're quite new and we're you know, we're still um, uh, defining things and um, our work is evolving. But we have we are asked quite a lot to, uh, to talk or to write and find that consistently a question that I think is completely understandable and, and, and inevitable is people asking, well, what does, a, what does a gender equal landscape build, what does a gender equal built environment look like? And there's a few different answers to that. In the UK, the honest answer is we don't know. And we don't know because the work hasn't been done, because it hasn't been considered important, because answering that question has never been on the cards of the people who write project briefs, the clients who commission, the people who establish um, master plan, which of course is, you know, is a phrase, is a pretty gender weighted phrase. Um, you know, all of the kind of the, the establishing of projects that happens early on, often before an, an architect is you know, even in, involved, um, that is, has not been being done with gender being a consideration. And not only has it been, not only has there been, there hasn't been a desire to do that, um, there also then hasn't been data being gathered. So that's then another really important thread within this, because... Um, and I highly, highly, I mean, anyone who's kind of interested in the subject area, I'd highly uh, recommend reading, I'm sure lots of you have heard of it, um, Invisible Women by um, Caroline Criado Perez. What um, Invisible Women is all, so much of it about is about gathering the data, to have the data to be able to point to, to say, these are the problems, these are the impacts. And in the UK, that data just, you know, what what works for women in terms of design, what is successful, what is problematic, that, that data has not been collated. Vienna is, a, is, a, is sort of the dream example um, of doing it well, where policy there requires that all new projects take into account, um, and this is across, um, across all forms of policy, that they take into account the needs of women. And so that then means that you're then able to start to dig into policy, dig into decisions being made at local or national government and looking at the impact and seeing what works. We're way in the UK, we are way behind on that um, because it hasn't been valued. And that value, you know, considering this important, is fundamental to, to taking this first step towards making change, you know, recognising that there is an economic case, not only is there a social justice case for making spaces that are equitable, shared, um, inclusive for all, there's an economic case for it as well, which I could go into at length, but I think that's quite enough of a um, long answer to your short question. Um, but another question has in like in relation to what you said um, in the current design in the way we live as well. Is there a way of taking advantage of well consideration of the current pandemic um, and how it would change the way we design homes? But um, application of you know your, the design consider these design considerations. Yeah, for sure. So I think I mean um, again again my 
you know, my kind of my my growing area of expertise is around is around gender. Um, so, you know, I uh, I suppose I come to that question from that point of view. I mean, it, as as a practitioner, I also I work my work is my design work is particularly around um, education, arts, and and community projects. So I suppose a kind of a blend of those two area of expertise. I think, in, I mean, what what we've seen so much um, in in the pandemic is the gap between those who have those who have the luxury of space. I mean, space has. I mean, everyone now understands that space is a luxury, and the way in which, um, you know, kind of five years ago, if I was talking to, sure, if I was talking to you know to to an architectural group, you know, we could have that discussion. But if I was talking to people who maybe aren't involved in design um, uh, or barely interested in design, talking about uh, spatial justice wasn't really a thing. I think what is extraordinary um, that has come out of the pandemic is that everyone now really, really gets what this issue is when you talk about um, the need to have spaces that are enjoyable, that are well designed, that are accommodating for different kinds of needs, that have natural light, that are able to host and hold different kind of family makeup. So, you know, really getting away from any notion of kind of one house fits all, you know, one apartment fits all. And that's that's an absolute nonsense. As architects, we know that, but it's been quite hard to persuade others. Um, you know, this the uh you know what we have gone through um, the pandemic has looking for a silver lining is something that's been you know horrendous for many people. It's put that onto the table in a way in which I think that before we kind of had to to do quite a lot of explaining, but now you know everyone really kind of you know day to day. You know, just talking to my neighbours, you know, everyone's talking about you know green spaces, um, access to you know access to. Um, outdoor space, having you know, having well-designed layouts and so on. So that I think is is a positive that um, the general pop. You know, this is a kind of a now discussion that we can have with a gen. You know, with with with, with non-architects um, and be pushing for better, um, which is positive. Um, I think that yeah, I think that kind of presents us presents us with an opportunity that we have. Um, that good design is no longer just a kind of a nice to have for a certain architectural clique. You know, it, everyone has seen the way in which this impacts people's day to day lives and how important it is and how incredibly unjust our built environment is in terms of, you know, the who, who has and who does not. Thank you very much. Um... You answered them all really well, so thanks for that. Thanks. Um, yeah, so we are coming down to um, finishing this part of yeah. the talk. Um, so we'll have a five-minute break, and then we'll go over the award winners uh, for the WHO show, um, the award, uh, Architecture and Politics. In terms of award winners, we're going to start off with uh, Joanna, who won the award. So if you give us an introduction and a presenta um, presentation of your work, that'd be great. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this is my um, master thesis project. Let me just quickly share the screen. Um, yeah, so the aim of my um, project was to produce a model for parasitic architecture as a solution for difficult urban sites. Um, sorry. Um, so I look at the site of San David's shopping center in Cardiff city center and developed a way to turn it into a inner city oasis where people from different age groups um, can live together as a community. And the thesis tried to answer a question of how to accommodate a large diverse neighborhood and urban environment while maintaining the human scale. So I have designed 82 dwellings with communal areas and cafe located on top of the Benham's rooftop that are part of a larger master plan over the whole retail site. Um, so I had three main aspirations for my project and they were di diversity, connection and affordability. 
so the schemes aim was to accommodate different economical groups, uh, both generation rent and bigger families. Um, so the community-based housing include both the use of shared amenities as well as um, as well as putting the contribution towards the shares of the scheme. Um, and one of the main drivers behind the design was the connection to both the street and outdoor, outdoor environment, so walkability and biophilia. And it was the biggest challenge of how to provide that uh, because of the nature of the site, which was the uh, rooftop. Uh, so the choice of the site was influenced by the flow of affordable housing, which is being built nowadays, so lack of it within um, city centers. Uh, so I looked at rooftops as those unclaimed spaces that can provide solution to the high market um, prices within within the city. Um, so the complex site has um, lots of constraints and the concept of the project was to use the existing envelope as a landscape um, and create interventions uh, with, with minimal impact on the existing structure. So I mapped the um, site in terms of its structural um, load capacity um, and uh, indicated the most structurally sound part as the road, um, which is currently used for truck deliveries. And I did the same for the opp opportunities, which are mainly the views of Butte Park and the existing uh, air handling servicing. Uh, the actual concept of the project came, came from a metaphor of sand dunes that are uh, carrying over without destroying the existing, but preserving it. And the idea was about taking this invisible world of rooftops and occupying it with parasitic interventions. Um, and even though the future of retail is uncertain um, and it may be closing down, the most sustainable solution was uh, for the fabri fabric to remain with possible change of, change of use in the future. And besides the financial aspect of the concept, rooftops create unique atmosphere that cannot be found elsewhere um, within the city. And as I've mentioned before, I focused my design over the uh, rooftop of Debenhams, as I found it to have the biggest opportunities for a hidden paradigms, as it is surrounded by both the uh, car park to the south and St. David's Hall to the west. Um, and the mapping shows kind of how each edge is occupied by the um, housing and the U-shaped mass is divided by another block, uh, which allows to create two courtyards, one more public and one more um, private. And the final overhang design um, allows for access at both the street level, um, here at the upper deck level, um, and transfers most of the load to the uh, rooftop road. Um, the typical modules uh, houses seven units, which aim at diverse users and vary from studios with access to communal areas to free bed apartments. And each unit has access to either the street or greenery or its own terrace, allowing for private outdoor space. And the rooftop um, geometry is uh, dictated by the staircases um, leading to the top floors and add to the already um, complex landscape. Um, so biophilia was a crucial part of my project as it helped create the unique atmosphere and affects um, mental well-being, um, offsets carbon emissions and becomes attraction points uh, for the public, uh, which at the same time provides the um, customers for the on-site cafes. Um, so as I mentioned before, the existing structure is minimally changed in order to minimize any risk of contingencies. So all the AC units are kind of enclosed in the steel um, sandwich uh, and the, construct, uh, the, the actual um, housing modules are constructed with lightweight, lightweight zip construction, uh, which allows for better environmental performance. And when it comes to materiality, the cladding chosen is rubber, which um, has sound properties, which is quite necessary in the city center location and with all the existing uh, rooftop servicing. So to sum up, the future of retail is uncertain. And um, with the switch to e-commerce, um, it is often seen as danger that can destroy public realm. But I wanted to show, um, I wanted to challenge that and show one of the solutions um, that can provide a sustainable future that uses the existing fabric and adapts it into a multifactual hub. Thank you. 
Thank you, Joanna. That was really a uh, beautiful imagery. Um, I'll pass it on to Annabelle, um, who has mentioned one of the um, honourable mentions from the external firm who juried you guys. Um, but yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Annabelle, uh, and I'll be presenting my third year project. Uh, share my screen. Okay, so um, my project, St. Govern's, is a project about memory. Uh, it seeks to heal the social fissures felt by Brexit and uncertainty around Pembroke Dock's future by creating generous, non productive spaces for locals to gather. Brexit has created a fissure between the people of Pembroke Dock, a town on the coast of Pembrokeshire in West Wales. The lack of middle ground between Leave and Remain gives rise to extreme views on both sides. Those with extreme views are more likely to reject and consider as inferior any belief differing from their own, leaving little room for compromise. This polarisation at a societal level can filter down to strain personal relationships. As a town built for the productivity of industry in the dockyard, Pembroke Dock relies heavily on European trade and its ferry links to Ireland. It's therefore understandable that uncertainty and opinion on the town's progression is divisive and cause for concern among its residents. Walter Benjamin was a German Jewish critic and philosopher who died fleeing the Nazis. Um, and in the Arcades project and throughout his work, Walter Benjamin refers to Eingedenken and Erfahrung. Eingedenken means remembrance and commemoration, souvenir and reminder, and Erfahrung means experience in the context of modernity and progress. Benjamin wrote that the deprivation of Erfahrung is one of the central losses in modernity. Remembrance allows for experience or erfahrung, and where there's experience in its emphatic form, elements of the individual past come into conjunction with material from the collective past. Intimate and public aspects of remembrance are brought together. The proposal has the purpose of evoking memory from the individual and collective past and creating space for shared experience or erfahrung among the Pembroke Dock community. It should remove the focus from the uncertainty of the town's progression and future through provision of generous indoor and outdoor public non-productive spaces. It invites informal use and evokes specific qualities of the site's spatial, material and programmatic past. The cornerstone of this proposal is the VC Gallery, a local charity in need for space for expansion and a connection to nature. They run art-based projects and workshops for the community aiming to engage people of all ages and backgrounds. In addition, they work with other sectors and offering any welfare support required from mental health to uh, finance and housing support. Um, so for the project, I identified the St. Govan Shopping Centre, um, a largely vacant 1980s arcade um, as the site of interest. It has a prime location in the centre of town um, with a presence on the high street and has been marked by the council as a site for development. I approached the project by joining the Pembroke Dock Old Photos Facebook group to uncover the latent meeting places, memories and erfaring of the site. Um, and I discovered that it's rich in spatial material and programmatic memory. Elements of these memories layer up to form a partly covered, partly ruinous garden wrapped by spaces for the VC gallery, artists and gardeners residences and opportunities for play, socialising and wrestling. The slowness of the train that once rolled through the site to the dockyard and the lines that can still be traced. The corrugated iron cladding of the Grand Cinema and vivid memories of watching films on a Saturday afternoon. The irregular characteristics of the tall house, a derelict shipyard building used as a playground by local children. And its language of the offset pitch and chimney, disproportionate openings and lean-to. These are some of the memories that are echoed through the scheme in buildings and spaces cast into burnt red clay. Material memories can be seen in the roof lines and openings, recesses and textures cast into the walls. The affaring of the old train and its slow, snow, slowness is evoked in the rail, railway alley with sensory planting along the border of a new path, tracing the tracks. Rhythmic openings lining the alley like a carriage provide glimpses into the gallery space and deep recesses offer quiet moments to sit and draw the plants that surround them. The flexible community space containing the VC art workshop expands into the main space and frames views of the garden. 
The main space has multiple uses as a gallery to display BC artwork and to hold community film nights, returning the FRM of the Grand Cinema to the site. The material memory of the Grand Cinema is also evoked in the corrugated form of its iron cladding, which is cast onto the Western Way facade. And the tool house is recreated as a ruinous playground, referencing memories of sneaking in through windows to play in the abandoned building and networks of tunnels and openings to climb through are carved in. So in conclusion, St. Govins connects material memory with local memory and the process of its creation has been about engaging with memory with the intention of making space for the community to come together. Thank you for listening and thank you to the exhibition team. Thank you so much, Annabelle. That was really, really beautiful in terms of remodeling and drawings. Um, okay, then second honorable mention was um, Christopher Rooney, but unfortunately he cannot make this. To what we're going on to next, which is the evening panel, so um, addressing a diverse future. So this, um, the brief for this discussion was involving how um, designing a diverse future, uh, sorry, how architecture can be designed to end dismissive behavior, as we mentioned earlier on with Zoe, um, and how this could may be generated with acknowledging of inclusion in uh, practice in academia. Um, so yeah, so this will feature Zoe, um, Femi Arenzea, um, Sarah Osei, and uh, Charlie Edmonds, which I'll let you guys introduce yourself. Who's going to go first? <laughs> you go Fair first, Femi. Oh, okay. Um, well, good evening, everybody. My name is Femi Arasanya. Um, I'm a principal at HOK's London studio uh, in central London. Um, I was a student at the Welsh School of Architecture between 1985 and 1990 and uh, really enjoyed myself there. Uh, I suppose since then I've designed a few buildings but um, and had great fun doing it. Um, over the last few years, I've um, been making my voice heard with regards to um, diversity, e equality, equity and inclusion within our profession, not just at the uh, professional end, but also at academia and trying to improve um, the the mix of diversity in, in the profession. So I suppose that's why I'm here tonight. And um, thank you for inviting thank me. You. Okay, does Sarah or Charlie want to go next? Sarah probably. You're muted, by the way. <laughs> Rookie mistake. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Say. Um, I'm a part one architectural assistant at HTA, uh, a 2019 architecture graduate from Ravensbourne University, London, and also a writer from Involved magazine with a real interest in community led design, um, social inequalities, displacement in um, communities, as well as community led design. Go next. Uh, hi everyone. I'm Charlie. I uh, am the one of the founders of Future Architects Front. Um, if you have never heard of us, just search it on Instagram. Um, I graduated uh, from my master's in the summer of 2020, um, and since then I've uh, joined a group called Civic Square as as a designer. So that's that's where I currently am. I can introduce myself again, um, just in case anyone's joined in this session that wasn't um, wasn't in before. But um, my name's Zoe Berman. I'm an architect. I'm director of a practice called Studio Berman Architects, and I'm the founder of an organisation called Part W which campaigns for gender equity within the built environment. We're a cross-generational group made up of women who work across the industry. So architects, engineers, um, design academics, transport um, thinkers and designers. Um, and we've run a number of campaigns over the last couple of years. Thank you. 
Um, okay, then. So I guess we can start off with uh, our questions. So before this, we gathered a series of uh, questions that were um, sent from students, um, also some concerns and how we could, so which um, we formed some questions from them. Um, so to start off, um, how would you teach aspiring young architects to be inclusive and aware of their own biases in the early stages of their career? So mainly kind of addressing to Zoe and Femi at the beginning. Okay. Um, interesting first question about teaching inclusivity, because ultimately we as architects, we, we design based on our own experiences. But when you're trying to teach architecture, um, I always say that you cannot teach what you do not know. Um, so that's the starter. And maybe I didn't actually, you know, say at the beginning, I'm also honorary professor at the Bartlett School of Architecture, where I focus primarily on, on, on professional practice. But, you know, I, just trying to think about when one's walking through schools of architecture, you know, what, you look at the teaching staff, for example, how diverse is that teaching staff? You know, do they come with different experiences or is it very much a one dimensional um, experience of potentially being white, male, middle class, probably fr privileged? You know, you cannot teach someone empathy unless they've kind of experienced it. So I always say, well, you know, the, the, the school of architecture. Look at them to start off starting and starting for 10, you know, how what's the gender split, you know? Is it a 50-50 male-female gender split? Let's just start with that. Let's not forget about color. Let's forget about ethnic backgrounds, you know? If it's more male-dominated, does that mean that's going to sway the, the curriculum and, and, and the teaching, you know? Um, and if not, does the school actually go out of its way to create a diverse workforce at all levels, not just at the part-time where you maybe give someone, you know, one, one day a month, to demonstrate, but you know, as you look through each of the levels from um, fellow researcher, senior lecturer, um, professor, um, is it diverse? Because if it isn't, you know, then the course and the school will not be diverse. You know, then you start looking at the curriculum. What is that curriculum based upon? Is it based on this Western ideal? Or is it now that we're becoming such a more, more, more closely together with regards to technology that we're actually looking further afield? We're looking at architects from from um, sub-Saharan Africa, or from you know, or from China, or from Bangladesh, or from India. You know, all those things will go towards trying to create a more rounded individual. Then you start thinking about you know, even when you get your projects, what level of stakeholder engagement do you have with the subject matter? How much do you read? Do you read outside? Do you go looking for interesting um, models? You know, do you look at architects and architecture that is not Western? Do you look at architects like Francis Carey, Demis Kwanko, Hassan Fathi, Jeffrey Bauer, and other non-female architects, you know, that, you know, I know everyone knows Zaha did, but there are other high-profile female architects that we do not seem to touch upon. And that's probably because of the fact that it's controlled by a very male-dominated white um, environment. Okay. Erasmus, year outs, breaks, you know. Does the school have a relationship with a school that is not like itself, you know, i.e., you know, uh, school in, say, Amsterdam, um, you know, or, or does it actually seek out a, a school, say, in South Africa or other developing nations to be able to exchange students? I don't think we do. Sorry, I might, it's a rhetorical question, but I don't, I don't think we do, you know? And then if you are well-minded and, 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 uh, uh, and maybe you've got the funds, maybe finding time to go and do something like become an intern for you and Habitat for two or three months. Or, and I do know that there are some students that have come from, from Cardiff who have been involved in the Corkin Studio, which goes out to Fiji and builds from scratch a, a building using local materials, using the local staff and understanding what it means to really be an architect. Because I know, and I'm, and I'm sitting here from a, dare I say, slightly privileged position now, you know, we, we design big buildings. But actually in the early days, I learned most from doing traditional small scale housing. 
And then finally, sorry, I'm going to stop in a minute because you've got me going. But, you know, unconscious bias. We all have it. I don't care. You know, you may be white, black, yellow, green. Everyone has an unconscious bias. But the skill of a good architect is to know what those biases of yours are and try to work with them or against them, right? You know, um, maybe taking taking on board an unconscious uh, bias training or even better still, a cultural intelligence assessment to actually understand what those are. Because when you know what your biases are, you can try and work towards it. And then just being making a conscious effort to try and learn from others outside your own world. I think I'm going to stop here now because I, I was only supposed to talk for 30 seconds, but I, I think I've gone on for a bit longer. So I'm going to stop and let someone else have a, a, have a go. I think that's you, Zoe. <laughs> Is it me? Okay. Yeah. Um, there's, uh, so I, I mean, I feel Femi's done such a beautiful job. I think of answering the question that there's not, there's not a huge amount that I can add. Um, I, I totally agree, um, Femi, with everything that you that you said. Um, you know, who, kind of who is doing the teaching? Um, what are the references that students are? Um, you know, the types of projects that that students are, are presented with, and you know, the sort of briefs that are set. Um, <clears throat> I think. I think this, and is, I was kind of interested when you you mentioned in that mention where you said Zaha Hadid. What that made me think of um, was the way in which I think often I, I think there's I think it's important to question notions of ideas of value um, and value in terms of how we how students work is is valued and recognised. Um, I think there's often a tendency within schools of architecture to um, promote the image. Um, and I think that's in a way, perhaps that's kind of because that's easy at some level. Um, you know, the, there are marking strictures of, you know, how to, you know, how we're kind of asked to grade student work. And I think the image um, has tended to dominate a little bit too much over the kind of the depth of thought of, you know, what that project could achieve in terms of social impact. And so we need to find a way to, and I suppose, you know, maybe there's a kind of a challenge back to the RIBA validation panel, um, you know, to sort of ask how, you know, explore how that balance can, you know, could could potentially be, be adjusted so that it isn't just about something that looks great, but also the thought the intention, the value system, you know, behind behind the work. Um, I think the only other thing that I might mention, just so that I don't um, uh, don't repeat all the good points that that Femi has made, I think from um, something that I think doesn't get talked about um, at all, because talking about money is, um, I think people get quite uncomfortable about it, but I think. Um, I think something that isn't really much in, doesn't really come up so much in discussion is how much tutors are paid. Because I know how much, I know how much WSA pays me when I'm teaching there. I know how much, you know, Reading pays me. And academia is not well paid at all, which means that then the people, and this comes back to the point that Femi made right at the beginning of who are the people who are doing the teaching, there's a real risk that teaching, teaching becomes a kind of a bit of a hobby and only certain people can afford to do that. And that means that, um, you know, teaching becomes part of a, a sort of a, a moment on your CV as part of steps for a, a, in an architectural career. And if you if you're not being well paid within academia, then that is going to have a very, very significant effect on the sort of people who are able to enter the profession because of the backgrounds which they come from. And that's really, really important in talking around inclusivity and diversity, particularly in terms of class. Um, so that I think is something that, um, you know, people uh, go, oh, you know, can't talk about how much we get paid. We need to. You know that that's. I think that's really really important that that comes into you know comes comes into the into the discussion. Thank you. Um, 
I know that uh, from a student perspective, Charlie had um, you had some more knowledge on um, exploitation from whether it's in practice or in uh, education. So following up what you said on becoming more of a hobby, do you have some things that you can implement on how this will be taken on forward by the students? Um, if you see, no, no, Charlie, sorry, I meant Charlie. Sorry, uh, do you mean like how can a student sort of engage with that as as a as a sort of problem that they might face in terms of the educators that they would be surrounded by? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I think a big issue that a lot of students face is that they aren't aware of this sort of, you know, the 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 mechanisms that Zoe just described that go on um it like you know in the you, you forget as a student that your tutors are there as a form of work it doesn't really occur to you to think about it that way because you're so you know invested in the sort of work that you have to do and you know getting your degree and things like that so i i, I do think an awareness of that situation would be very beneficial um, to a lot of students. And, you know, it, you know, like what, one thing that happened at uh, Cambridge, for example, was that um, the, the architecture department, the students sort of got fully involved when there was a uh, strikes, for example. Um, some of you might've even seen the picture of uh, there were st uh, students hanging out like, flares out the window of Scroop Terrace, uh, raising the sort of profile of those strikes. So I think it's, um, you know, as, as, as well as trying to sort of improve our collective consciousness around these issues, I think it's also about, you know, showing that sort of solidarity when there are things like strikes for lecturers, for example, um, because at the end of the day, more equity in teaching and architecture will sort of only improve the quality of your own education. And then that, that, that solidarity then sort of transcends outside of university into the, the, the rest of the profession, your professional life. So I, th I think it's, it's something that, you know, can really sort of snowball into a lot of great to positive effects. If you, if you really sort of get plugged in and become aware of, of that sort of, unspoken world of uh salaries and um you know what it means to pay a living salary versus what it means to pay uh, a minimum wage for example so it's yeah it's 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 hugely important and it's connected to so many things i think if i might um if i might just jump in on that i think it's i think it's a really really charlie you're absolutely right i think it's incredibly difficult for you as students to, um, you know, to kind of know about those things when from, you know, you at the moment, um, as and I mean you um, collectively as, as students, uh, uh, you know, from, from your side, you are, and, you know, the fantastic work that your organisation has done, um, I mean, is then kind of thinking from the other side of what kind of experience are you getting for your fees? Um, and I think what what is uh, I think there's a real complexity, and I think a lot of us who are in academia saw this clash coming um, when fees were brought in or when fees were were ratcheted up because I I paid fees when I went to university, but nothing like what you're paying now. That it really, really, you know, fees really change. The, um, I mean, in a way, fees existed before. It's just who was paying that. It wasn't that education was, you know, no one was being paid. There were no costs. There were costs. It's just who was bearing the, bearing those costs was government. Um, you know, it was a different kind of investment. Um, and now you're pushed into a, you know, we're mutually pushed into a, a complex situation where, um, you are the customer 
And, uh, you know, a lot of the tutors who sit in front of you doing your design teacher are kind of the supplier, but we're not really because the, you know, universities are, are huge institutions. I think what, I think what's the, the kind of the, the, the perhaps the kind of broader issue here is about institutions generally um and you know this sort of context where in the in you know, in the UK you know chief exec of the NHS is paid 220,000 pounds a year whilst you know a nurse's salary is on average 30,000 you know chief execs of universities are paid, you know, I, I, I happen to know um, that, you know, at UCL, UCL was the highest paid, I think, the person who was in that position was £740,000 a year. Um, whilst, you know, the kind of the hourly rate of the people who are, you know, doing the teaching, again, like, you know, nurses, the kind of the day to day, you know, I mean, it's, a, it, it, you, know, it's you know, it's not even the same financial planet. And that's about institutions and structural, structural inequalities, um, and 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 I and I think it's I think it's difficult for you to you know Charlie for you to kind of immediately come up with a solution. You know this is what we'll do, but I think that you know it's it's, it's about those structural issues of imbalance, um, and the more that we can spotlight that, the more we might collectively be able to start to move towards you know, better ways of doing things. And just to jump on from you, Zoe, as well, I think coming from like a student perspective, um, joining architecture or being a student who is studying architecture, it can be quite hard financially, especially from a low socioeconomic background. Um, how do we pay for modelling? In some, in some schools, they pay for printing. How do we do that? Um, um, so it's challenging those kind of issues too and allowing people from those backgrounds to actually study architecture because that can be off-putting um, for, for them. And in that way, we're losing talent because of it. Yeah. I think that shifts potentially, um, I think that potentially shifts the wider conversation into... Mm -hmm into uh, kind of thinking about encouraging, exploring options for more nimble kinds of architectural education for, you know, more opportunities for part-time, you know, part-time working, um, you know, and, and that being much, much more supported, um, you know, other, other modes of education, other ways of gaining learning, um, apprenticeships and so on, you know, other, other routes to gain education rather than this very much, um, you know, full time, full fees and anything else, I think, for a while has been seen as kind of secondary, um, you know, and that I mean, that's very much into a, you know, a very kind of uh, current discussion that is happening at government level right now about, you know, how do we, you know, how, how do we um, revalue and re-promote alternative forms of education that are you know, different to the you know the kind of the conventional university track and and that's about you know new forms of value and um uh more nimble kinds of education which might mean um there's all sorts of things we can talk about well, you know it might yeah. mean um, well, I mean, Femi. yeah, I mean, as, as, as you know, as, as you know, we've been working quite hard. It's been a group of architectural practices that have been working really hard at trying to get the apprenticeship level exactly the same as all the other disciplines. And that came through in the last month. So, you know, if you are able to get um, an architectural apprenticeship, the course now will be paid to the tune of 9,250 quid, which is now the same, believe it or not, only just this year that has happened, mm. whereas previously it was at 7,000. So mm. it did, it gave firms, unless they were quite wealthy as practices, they would have to contribute to the fee as well as pay the student. So, you know, we are getting there, but yeah. the, the issue still is, you know, we want in in order to in order to try and increase the base of potential architects we we have to promote the profession outside of its usual areas you know so going to state schools um 
go into places and, you know, having apprentices, the problem that I think we've found, especially with, with the COVID pandemic, is that, you know, a number of firms have made people redundant across all levels. Um, it's been quite difficult to, to mentor graduates in practices when you're doing it in this forum. So I'm, I'm really pleased that, you know, um, offices are opening up again and, we may have lost a year um, for, for for students, but actually, I, I'm I'm hopeful, and I because I am the eternal optimist that practices will be going hell for leather to try and make up for the year that some students may have have lost, and hopefully, irrespective of uh, the potential issues with regards to Brexit and coming out of COVID, that practices will step up because we know that if we don't get graduates working, we're going to lose you. And, you know, once we've lost you to, to someone else, when they realise that actually architectural students are really good graduates, they're not just good designers, they're great problem solvers and thinkers, you know, um, they'll say, oh, maybe you'd like a career in so there I say banking or financial stuff because you're quite good at creative stuff so you know I think practices we, we're going to be working really hard at, at uh, resetting that balance um, in the next in the next coming months um, as I say in the early stages of career if you're lucky enough to be able to just travel and just to experience life, because the best architects are those who that have experienced life and not and haven't just, I think as Zoe said, just drawn pretty pictures, you know, um, Grafton Architects who, who won who won the RIBA uh, gold medal um, won just before David Ajay. Their architecture is based on functionality and need and serving the community and the environment. And I think if more of us start thinking about that and not just going for the, uh, you know, the pretty image and, and the sexy shape, but actually understanding that we're here to serve society. We're here to try and make the world a better place by designing buildings that are fit for purpose and addressing a particular need. I'm going to stop there. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for that. Um, that's what I was going to say. Just feel free to jump between each other. Um, so going to like another question. Um, so within practice and um, academia, there is this concern of this toxic culture. But one of these concern is also the intellectual hierarchy um, that causes a problem of people who are kind of less privileged background, especially in education, um, to engage. So the teaching has become more selective rather than inclusive. So how would such a thing maybe addressed? Uh, anyone, really? I think the last couple of years has allowed universities, uh, both the students and the lecturers, to, to really look at themselves and to realise that we we can't just dare I say, design for a very small sector of society. Um, we do have problems, yes. Um, uh, I'm not saying that all universities are like this, but there's one particular university that has been in the press over the last few, few months um, where students have been complaining of, you know, long-term issues that date back to, like, you know, 2007, they've been making complaints about sexism and racism within the the, the, the teaching and, and, and studying of, of architecture. Um, and that's because, unfortunately, the staff hasn't been diverse. You know, um, there, there has almost been this sort of hierarchy of individuals and, you know, the professor basically pretending that he's got his own fiefdom and what he says goes. And, you know, if you want to pass, you need to suck up to them and, you know, suffer the um, embarrassment of, of having a bad crit or something. Or maybe if you do not think the way that they want you to think, i.e. you don't like their architects that you're not going to do terribly well. Um I think that's improving over the last few years because, um, you know, the, the media, the press, the coverage is, is there. 
but I still go back to, you know, it's about the makeup of the staff because unless someone, you know, just like in work and unfortunately academia is a microcosm of, of society, probably a very small sector because, you know, um, that's probably one of the reasons why I started to get involved. I never considered myself that I'd be really involved in academia after finishing, but, you know, I was invited to initially examine. And I definitely, when I went in, I thought, oh, it's a pretty white crowd here. I think I need to step up. You know, I made that conscious decision. Um, Zoe said, you know, I, you know, I'm not doing it for the money. Trust me. You know, I, I, I you know, it's, it's not, I'm not teaching. I'm not being present in academia because it's it's a it's a financial it's a financial benefit. It's be there because I want to be the person. You know, you cannot be what you cannot see, right? So we do need people to give up time. Um, people that have made it, and I, please, I I actually go to colleagues in other firms who I know have done quite well, um, who are from you know different backgrounds, and say, look, you need to step up. Yeah, you, know, you need to get in there, even if you're giving up a day of your time, even if you're taking a day's leave to go into an institution, maybe as a visiting critique or, or just maybe to have a tutorial, you know, that's how you get rid of that quote unquote toxic culture. Because toxicity only happens when no one is prepared to actually stand up and say, you've just said something that is inappropriate. You know, what's that term? What's that phrase? You know, um, Culture is determined by by the worst possible um, behavior that is tolerated, right? So if, you know, if me, if I hear someone, a male colleague say something that is either sexist or racist, I'll go up and say, you've just said something wrong there. And I will shame you there and then. I won't wait until a little quiet moment when everyone's gone. People need to know there are boundaries, just like in, in life. I suppose it's like raising children, isn't it, really? <laughs> You know, everyone needs to know their boundaries. And some people, they get to a position in a firm or in academia where they believe they are untouchable and improachable. Well, no one is above the law. No one is. No one should be able to, to, to have a specific view that is contrary to everyone else's, especially when the wider population or the wider group think, actually, he said something that's slightly out of tune, but, you know, he's the professor. We've got to let it go. You know, students need to, and I, I get it. Students will say, well, Am I really going to stick my head above the parapet? Because this is the same guy that's going to grade my work. So it needs to be colleagues that that need to that need to stand up and say, you know, you've you you've, you you you're out of line, my friend. You need to sort yourself out. And and you know, provinces and heads of department need to be brave enough. You know, it doesn't matter how talented an individual you are if your if your culture and your attitude isn't right. And I'm going to be quite controversial here because I have used this before. I'd rather have a hole in my team than an arsehole in it. Um. Good phrase. I think there's um, I think there's multiple, there's also kind of multiple layers of where toxicity can come from. Um, I think Femi has talked about it from perhaps um the point of view who those who are in positions of responsibility i think there's also i mean from what i uh certainly experienced when i was a student and i sometimes see traces of in students who i teach is the internal competition between students um you know architecture is incredibly internally competitive i think a lot of that yes can come from expectations from from tutors I think there's also an opportunity for students um, where they feel able to to just sometimes not participate in the nonsense um, and like I I was very proud I continue to be very proud of the fact that personally I've never done an all-nighter ever never um, I think that's an absolute nonsense and I was always delighted when I left. So I studied my part one at Sheffield and my part two um, at London Met. And I remember particularly in part one, I was just always delighted to walk out of the studio and say, yeah, I'm off to the cinema. I'm going home. Like I'm going to go, I'm, I'm going to meet my boyfriend. I'm going out for a drink. Like all that, all those things that we're 
missing if we don't feel we're able to go to the theatre, go do some sport, go meet our friends. That's all architecture as well, because all of that other wider culture is informing your mind. And I think there is, uh, I suppose, wanting to give students the, the confidence, you know, any students who are kind of listening to this now, when you turn up for a job interview, we don't say, how many all-nighters did you do? Um, you know, because actually, well, you know, my practice certainly does, and I don't, I, none of my immediate friends do, because that's not what we value. We value people who are efficient, who are able to um, do the work and then go to the pub. Um, so I think there is scope for, you know, at multiple layers of re-challenging the values on which we are conducting ourselves at all sorts of different levels. Um, so I hope that actually kind of gives some students confidence sometimes to, to step out and um, rethink, you know, your own kind of patterns of work. Femi has his hand up. Yeah, I just, it's a fantastic point that you've made there, Zoe. I, I was invited, I think, earlier in the year to to um, be a, a critique for some students' work. I can't remember which institution. It may have been Cardiff or it may have been Bartlett. And you could tell some students who, dare I say, have either invested so much into their work that they felt they needed to do this all-nighter, when actually... You know, it's about the kernel of the idea. It isn't about doing 54 drawings, um, you know, with X number of views, you know. And I, do, I, re, I specifically remember telling one student, I, could, I said, I'm sorry, but you need now to switch off your computer and go to sleep. First of all, go to the pub, grab a beer, then go to sleep and do nothing else. Because Zoe's quite right. In an office environment, we're all about the person that, can come up with the idea, work when we need to, okay? But then life is what teaches you to be a good architect. It's not about that all-nighter, okay? Maybe, uh, Zoe, there there are individuals who, dare I say, they've, you know, they're looking at it from the I cannot fail scenario, and therefore they've, they've only got the one chance because maybe they're on, you know, a... Uh, you know, they borrowed the money, they, whatever it is. And hence the reason they feel that they, they've got to give everything. And so great, it's great that some schools actually shut the doors, you know. Some schools will say, I'm sorry, but you are only working from seven till seven and you're not allowed in the studio after that. That's forcing a change in the way that schools um, act and saying, look, you know, we don't need, because sometimes, and I've, I've been on the RIBA uh, validation panel, you know, where it's it's evident that some schools are so competitive that they, they sometimes lose sight of, of the student. And therefore, the amount of work that they want as, as a submission. So mm -hmm. some schools are saying, actually, we need, you know, four drawings. It's just like a bid, you know, in, in practice, where now, you know, bidders are saying, are actually saying, we only need three A1 drawings of this. No more, no less. You're only allowed to write 400 words for this submission and we'll base it on that mm -hmm. and I think if more institutions start doing that and it then allows students to realize that the student experience isn't all about drawing <laughs> it isn't all about the 24 hours it's about traveling and reading and experiencing architecture um Sarah and Charlie what do you think yeah so I was just gonna jump in with that just recently being a part one I don't really think that was kind of taught to us so we kind of almost came with the idea that we need to just work until we get the work done. I mean, my unit didn't close until 11, 12 o'clock. So it was open. So it, it wasn't a case of, you know what, uni is done. <laughs> you can go home. It was open for us to do the work. So that idea of shutting off wasn't clear for us as um, undergraduates at all. And I think I saw that kind of, change when I started working in the profession so working at HTA they tell us to kind of stop working at 5 30 like for your mental health to stop you don't really see that in the news at all so I think that's why the majority of us keep on working because there, there are these pressures of finishing the checklist or getting your models done or going to the 
prototyping room to get a model done for a crit tomorrow or if you don't do this you won't succeed and I think there's a wider idea of succeeding it's not just being in um, uni and getting a good grade it's actually you paid nine thousand. you want to do well for your parents or maybe your first generation um, student going into uni and all these things are in the back of your mind as well so the idea of telling students to stop working for me when I graduated in 2019 and started in 2016 was not there it was not apparent and I only saw that kind of push for your mental health in the profession yeah Yeah, I would agree with that and I, I would also say that I'm I'm always a little wary when the when we highlight a problem of something like students working all nighters uh, or a sense of um, unhealthy competition in universities, and then we say the solution is to close the studio or the solution is something that is sort of directly altering the behavior of the students, it, it just seems a completely upside down way of thinking to me because at the end of the day, who creates the facilitation of this competitive culture? It's not the students, it's the university, it's the educators. And I always get a little bit of a sense that things like closing the studio, it just seems to be a bit of a, almost like a quick fix where you, rather than reflecting on what's creating this culture, what's creating this unhealthy way of working, we just try and sort of shut down the symptoms. And then, you know, it it might be successful to an extent, but then what do you do about then the students who can afford to have their own, you know, 2000 computer at home and they just continue doing the work compared to the student who can't afford to do that? You know, you, you open up all of these new potentials for further exacerbating um, the problems that you're trying to fix. So it's for, for, for me, it's, it's a lot more about trying to do the more difficult work of interrogating the culture that's been built and trying to think, how do you, how, how do you deal with that? You know, why are we so individualistic in the way that we work in university? Why in a profession, which is fundamentally collaborative, is 95% of our university work done from an individual point of view? Why in a profession where we literally cannot achieve anything without people outside of architect, architecture, do we work in a way where we act as like omnipotent sort of beings who simply conjure buildings into existence as if out of thin air? It's There's, there's a lot of like really deeply illogical conditions that we create in architecture school and a sort of individualistic approach to the work that it 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 just it doesn't like it doesn't make any sense and it it doesn't allow for sort of a collective spirit or mentality that could push back against this idea of competitiveness um and you know we actually what one message that was put in the chat about how it's always the minority that have to step up and sacrifice. Why can't the majority welcome them in? I know that was referring to a different point that we discussed, but, you know, I actually think that's a really important aspect, which is that it, if, if, if we want to like really address these issues, it, it, I think it has to come from a position of like solidarity and um, collective thinking. I, I don't, I don't think you can genuinely address these problems from a sort of, top-down um position and that that you know that's why we advocate collective action activism um campaigning grassroots organizing that's why that's such a big part of everything that we do is um because i I think that's really the, the only way that we're gonna bring architecture from this very introspective individualistic place that it's been for a very long time to something that can actually serve the future um address things like the climate crisis you know it's all it's all interconnected uh, at some level um 
but yeah, I feel like I've massively gone off on a tangent now. But no, um, I, mean, I really, I, I really enjoyed lots of what you said, including this point on on collectivism, which is something that for me, I kind of pops up um, on the radar of the activist work that Part W has done in regard to awards. Now, if you look just using the gold medal as an example, and it is an example, um, uh, a kind of a, it is pro, it is sort of a metaphor for a wider, wider issues. Um, I thought that there wasn't enough uh write up an acknowledgement of the fact that when Yvonne Farrell and Sherry McNamara were given the got got the phone call you have got the gold medal um they said the medal goes to Grafton they are the only name on that marble wall that is Grafton architects every single other one is a name yeah. is a name everyone and that was their choice and a lot of the photographs that you then see that represents that moment that will have been the images that they provided as an office that was their decision in you internally um that the photographs are um the two of them as directors sitting with their whole team um, and that that point that you make, Charlie, about the the individual, I mean, it's just, it's bizarre, you know, and this is an award which has been going on since 1848 and every single year, it's, I get the award. You've, you've got a thousand people who work in your office, you all get the award, um, you know, and that's a very, it's a, you know, I, I kind of, I mention, you know, I mentioned an award that has been going on since 1848. That is a lot of history that has deep roots um, in notions of individualistic, um, which you're absolutely right, is perplexing, to say the least, in an industry which is absolutely founded on, on collective work. Um, and and I think that, that's, that, that is, in a way, slightly the problem with, with our profession, you know, mm. um, in the sense that, they're always the media wants one person um up until recently you know uh, you know it's one person even even the most recent gold medal winner david Ajay, we all know he's there's a massive team behind um and it's always very difficult sometimes for collectives to win that big prize because who is that person behind uh som and hok um, uh, you know the, the, the part W collective. We've we we it's it's a problem that we've created for ourselves, I, I think, and I think we need to find a way around it. You know, um, many of you have read my bio, my love of rugby and team sports. You know, just like my team, we are a team. That's why you know, and we we rise and fall together. But that's just us. That's different. You know, we, we're slightly outside from everyone else. Um, you made you made another interesting point, Charlie, about why is it that academia is always about the individual, whereas you know, practice is about the collective. We need to get around that. I know that there are some courses, and I, I, I'm just using Cardiff as an example. There are group projects where you 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 are assessed as a group. Um, I know at part three, that especially where, where where I am involved in, there are there are elements of that course which are marked as a group. Yes, there is a point where there needs to be some individual effort and you're marked on that. But, you know, maybe as, as we start to look at it, how can we ensure that the group element is, is um, properly uh, marked? Um, but then by that same thing, the thing about a group is there will always be, you know, there's always the leader, there's always, there's always a follower, there's someone who's, you know, as they say, if architecture is a contact sport and it's a team sport, you can't have everyone being the designer. Someone needs at some point to, to project manage and to, you know, make sure that you're making all the deliverables. Um, so and I believe that there are courses and there are schools that, that take that on board. 
you just it just depends what school you that you happen to study in. <laughs> I think Charlie, if you really, if um, if Future Architects Front really wanted to dig into that question, um, and I know you have a huge amount that you're doing, um, and you know this may not be one, but if it were something that genuinely there are um, a group of students who wanted to uh, dig into that, are. Uh, I would suggest talking to the um, very nice people. I know I know they're a nice team um, within our IBA education because ultimately where everything kind of lands at the moment is our IBA criteria. Um, and so actually, you know, almost sit down with, you know, with that team and say, look, how could we be pushing for a, a unit um, you know, a kind of a third year unit, or, and I'm, you know, I'm just referring to the Well School of Architecture structure. Um, that, you know, how, how could how could we as a as a group of students arrive in front of, um, you know, with our university, with our tutors, how could um, we arrive in front of you with um, projects that are collective? And you know, what what would what would the R I you know what would what is the RIBA's position on that? Personally, I I don't know. I don't know. But they're kind of where the valid where the educational validation at the moment, the validation buck stops. Mm, yeah, there's. I think we're definitely in a good um, position, both as an organisation and in terms of like where we are in this point of time to address those kinds of questions because. Um, We've spoken to the ARB about how they're going to be implementing some apparently quite significant changes oh. in the the ways that accredit- oh. accreditation is um, done. Yeah. So I think, and you know, I, I think you spoke to them as well, unless I'm misremembering. But um, you know, one of their primary concerns to their um, credit is issues about equity um in the profession so yeah i think there's definitely a lot of um a lot of space to kind of organize and campaign around around these uh these topics but um yeah Yeah. i I suppose as a kind of having made that suggestion but also then also stepping back and then acknowledging as you know as someone who uh runs in my you know, kind of alongside my practice, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, I'm kind of convener of, you know, alongside brilliant, brilliant other people um, doing the the kind of activism work. I equally, having said that, I equally recognise um, how incredibly exhausting, hard and frustrating it is that those people who are, who are in some way being faced with and bearing the brunt of inequality are consistently being asked to do the work and being asked to do that work to overcome the issues for free. Um, and it's, you know, the kind of the, I mean, you will have had this, um, I'm sure as, you know, future architects front of, you know, the kind of the extra having said, I didn't do an all nighter. I, you know, I don't, I, I, I don't, you know, the extra hours that are loaded onto your, onto your day or your weekend to be asking asking these questions and kind of doing the doing the leg the activist legwork it is unpaid labor and it is it is immensely valuable but it is hard and tiring um so i just wanted to kind of acknowledge having said oh it's something you could explore equally it's totally right to say got enough on thanks <laughs> On an unrelated note, uh, everyone watching, uh, if you go to the Future Architects Front social media page, you'll find a donation button in the top right corner. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's um, it's it's a problem that you know. It, at the end of the day, that is a, an unavoidable thing with like all activism, right? Like that's not something that's exclusive to us. That's any grassroots campaign. At the end of the day your grassroots because you're not in a position of power to make a change. So as, as, as much as I would love, you know, the Reba to pay us for every time we've um, met with them and 
convince them to make a change. You know, it's just not the way it works at the end of the day. And even even if that were to be the way it works, you know, does that then compromise our legitimacy as like an independent group? You know, so it's 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 a real sort of tangled um, knot of, uh, of 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 issues. But um, yeah, you know, we've 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 sort of come to terms with that. And like, you know, luckily everyone in FAF has some form of um, uh, you know, whether we're doing PhDs or whether we're employed, you know, we, we, we all have the means to like look after ourselves. So we, you know, that, that's a relative position of privilege that we all have. So, mm. you know, I think you, you, you have to use whatever extra space you have in your conditions to try and, um, improve things because for a very, very large number of people, there isn't that extra space. So, it's um it's it's just sort of doing what what you can where you can just going off what charlie said i think 2020 has shown us that we do all have voices and i and i think that um a lot of us especially coming from undergraduate were kind of scared to maybe say this is not right this is not okay because um it wasn't a collective sound. And when there's not a collective sound, most of the time we're not heard. And so I think, especially going digital in this new kind of era that we're in, has allowed us to have a voice, and maybe not say what we want to say in front of someone. There's a screen in front of us, so we're more confident in saying what we need to say. But um, collectives like Involved and um, FAF actually having a voice, giving us a voice has been really, really important um, in the improvement of education and in our pre- profession. And I think we're a long way of real sufficient change, but we're on the right um, steps moving forward, for sure. That sounds really great. Um, yeah, you guys, I had a series of questions, but it had gone in a different path. But in, <laughs> no, in, in a really great way. Um, but in um, regards to what was mentioned, um, so within the system, I think, Femi, you did a, a while back a talk on race, uh, architecture and the biases of race as well. And you mentioned where things would start from the top so higher up in practice that would lead to um well to graduates and maybe influential to education would that still kind of be relevant in this well it has to go it's, it's got to go from the top and the bottom it's got to work you know leaders leaders have got to acknowledge it doesn't matter what their background is or their ethnicity they need to acknowledge that um a, a diverse workforce actually improves the the product uh, of what we do, um, and then on the on, on on the way up as well, you know, the grassroots movement, people getting involved, um, because again, it's it's taken it's taken a while. It you know, architecture in the past has been the preserved. I was once explained. Someone explained to me that oh yeah, most most architects they're they're the second son. Because the first son gets the inheritance, and so the second son has to go and do something. But you know, he's in a position to be influential. Okay, so we we're changing that 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 graphic, right? Um, but as you rise up, if if you can imagine that most architectural practices they're either formed of partnerships from people who were who had a trust fund who who were able to start with with with, with something, and their the first patrons were probably their parents or family friends, and that's how they they built out. Um, you know, nowadays it's becoming more and more difficult to to try and set up a practice by winning the competition. Right. Previously, you were able to do that. Now, in order to enter a competition, you have to submit, or you need to be on the framework. So again, you know, there are all these sort of barriers along along the way. Um, it's great now, I think, that uh, there are frameworks that are coming into being which are specifically 
um, earmark to smaller practices, to um, practices that I that are diverse, you know, um, or that they're all female practices or, or something, just to be able to give someone a, a foothold to demonstrate their skills. We've got so many talented individuals in our profession. It's about being given the opportunity. And I've I've argued long and hard that sometimes firms that get on the onto big frameworks, they don't get on frameworks because they're good designers. They get on because they've got good copywriters and they've got chaps who or chapesses who are able to put together a good bid. You know, we want to get to a position where, you know, a, a, a competition is won because it's the best design, because it really understands the brief. You know, that the person who's actually put forward a, a solution has understood the site, the location, the constraints, the opportunities. But quite often, those individuals won't ever get to the table because they haven't got a team who's busy putting together a massive inquiry bid or a SQ. So we need to get over that. And What's quite interesting now is that some of the major framework providers are saying, okay, you can be a big firm and, and get on the framework, but we want to know what what your um, what your team's looking like. How diverse is that team? Are you going out to smaller practices? Are you helping smaller practices? Um, or maybe actually you've got to have a small practice or sorry, an up and coming practice as part of your bid. Otherwise, we will not consider you. So yes, the person who's actually holding that um, the purse strings is now determining what sort of um, architecture they want because now they're realizing that the people that are going to buy from them, they're going to say, "How diverse was that team? You know, mm -hmm. what are your green credentials? How are you on diversity? How are you on gender equality? You know, you're maybe developing in in an area of I'm going to use for example London." Yeah, you may be developing in an area of London that has previously been um, socially deprived. Are members of your team from that background? Or, better still, um, maybe you're going to employ someone, or maybe the contractor's going to employ someone from that background. How are you able to demonstrate that? Those are the things that are happening now because of the movements like Charlie's and, you know, and, and, and the, and the um, Women in Architecture and the W Collective. They're starting to push it. And the people that are holding the purse strings are suddenly realizing that actually we need to do this. Otherwise, we won't be around. Because ultimately, that's what determines change. You know, fear of losing determines change. <laughs> yeah. Does that sort of answer your question? It really does definitely um but i also realized that we've come to towards the end of the um uh, session um which is a shame because i did have quite a few more things to say in regards uh, and some more questions but yeah um but well, can i just add, and i'm sorry i'm yeah, hogging sure. i know you you did pose one other question what's the riba doing about it okay um so i'm gonna put my other hat on which is as an riba elected member okay mm -hmm. i forgot to tell you that early on um but you know, we've been fighting long and hard to try and get diversity higher up the agenda. And the RIBA, fair play to them. They've said, hands up. We've not done it right. We've been slow getting off the mark. But now we're, we're taking it seriously. There is, you know, um, recently appointed earlier in the year, Marshall, Ram, uh, Marshall Ram, Ramroot, who is diversity of inclusion, the first ever di director in charge of diversity within the RIBA. She's pushing through. You know, for people out there, they're saying, well, what has it done? They're getting their house in order first. They're looking within because in order to be able to push out that message, they've got to sort out their house first. OK, things are happening. But, you know, the RIBA is there for you as students, for me as a member, as a practicing architect and, and for everyone. Um, but they're working at it. Give them time. There's a new president on board, Simon Alford. He is banging on that drum as well. And, you know, whilst I still am um, elected, I will be probably gather I won't be keeping myself quiet. I will be banging on for e equity, diversity and inclusion um, at all at all levels of, 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 our, of our profession. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, 
at the end now. So, um, but if I guess we have to wrap this up. Um, so, thank you so much for all the panelists. Um, it was really insightful, um, and I know that this is also recorded. So, um, it, yeah, <laughs> you're muted, by the way. Sorry. If I've said something on toward, it's because I'm in every single word yeah. of it. All mm -hmm. right. We, as a profession, we want to be exemplar in the built environment. And we can only be exemplar if we actually understand our own weaknesses and our own misgivings. And then we try to make, we try to address them. So I don't apologize for a single word I've said. Um, and, you know, if it holds people, if people who are listening or people who will listen later on think, actually, we do need to look within ourselves because it's only that way we can actually improve and become better, then all be it. I'm really glad you said that. That's awesome. Um, okay, then. Um, so to wrap this up, um, so thank you so much, all of you. Um, I hope you guys, um, I mean, enjoy this. Um, but yeah, so we might have to end this. Thank um, you for yeah. hosting. Thank you. No worries. <laughs> right. Thank you very um, much, Rosella. No worries. All right. I was, it nice was great meeting you guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.